that really nice introduction, Jan. Thank you for having me here and for putting me last. Uh, I, I know you said it's my job to keep everybody awake, so I'll try to do that. Um, so I, I think I'm going to try to do something a little bit different. Um, to start, we've been talking about the really big world out there that's very hard for any of us to see or touch or interact with way out in space, the little stuff that's inside of us that makes our whole body some kind of living factory of an unbelievable uh, efficiency. And I want to talk about us, what we can do. And I want to focus on us as scientists and us as terms of our human creativity. And the last thing I'd like to do that's going to be a little bit different is I don't want to do a whole big overview of lots of work giving you finding after finding, which has been extremely intriguing and thrilling, but rather drill down a little bit deeper into a couple of studies because I think the things that I'd like to share with you are things that you can actually use in your own work to perhaps be better scientists. What I want to do is share with you basically the following set of results. We're going to go into the web of science, which is the largest known repository of all scientific work ever recorded on the planet. Contains about 20 million scientific papers from 1950 to today. I'm going to go into every single one of those 20 million papers, and I'm going to look to see, is there a signal for what makes high impact work? The way I'm going to approach this is I'm going to take it from the view of creativity, that what human beings want is something new and novel, and that's part of what gets us along the way of having something of high impact. The story I'm going to wind up telling you is, is that novelty is, in fact, prized in our area, but it's only prized when it's mixed with conventionality. And conventionality winds up playing a very large role in our ability to find new scientific discoveries. I'm also going to talk about how you solve this problem as an individual. And it's going to turn out that you can't solve this problem on your own. You can't find this mixture of conventionality and novelty that's going to turn out to be so important on your own. You could only do it in combinations with others. So atypical combinations here is going to be not only the atypical combinations of prior work that you put together to make your new discovery, but it's also going to be atypical combinations of the people you work with. One way to start this is to know that people have been thinking about this problem for a fairly long time. Even Einstein talked about thinking outside the box. And one of the things that he was talking about was, you know, if you want to do something that's new and that's going to be important to people, it needs to be unconventional. If you continue to do the norm, then you are going to just produce the norm, conventional results. Think differently, and you may find the answer. In fact, if you go into the research on human creativity, there's lots of different ways that people have looked at it, but there's probably one thing that everybody agrees upon, and it's basically this, that the way in which creativity is spurred is when you put together things that hadn't been put together before. And in fact, what we know is that many of us find this problem extremely difficult. I teach most of my work, I, I do most of my teaching in a professional school. And I could tell you a great deal of what we do is we try to have people be more creative. Because it's something that's very hard for people to do on their own. How do you go about putting together different things? One of my favorite examples of this, and just how difficult it is, comes from uh, looking at, if you go through uh, the historical record, you'll see lots of places where this turns out to be true. You could look at Marie Curie. She put together two things that hadn't been put together before. Mullis did it as well. In a different way, Edison did it. And much of what we try to do is find a way to reproduce this. An example that I like to think about when I think about how difficult this problem is, is I like to think of uh, a movie called Blood Simple. It was created by the Coen brothers. I'm just curious, how many people here know the Coen brothers? Coen Brothers are a famous uh, movie-making pair. They're writers and directors. Their first movie was called Blood Simple. It's actually what made them Hollywood darlings and really famous. Uh, but they've gone on to go make lots of other movies you probably know about, like Fargo, The Great Lebowski, No Country for Old Men. And it's really quite interesting. If you go back to the very first movie they made and the way in which they thought about conventionality and novelty, they tell the story in the following way. Their very first script was Blood Simple. 
And after they wrote the script, they looked at it, and what they realized was it was a very conventional whodunit. Basically, it followed a pattern that had been followed many times prior to them. And they realized that in this conventional story, it wasn't going to be very attractive to people. So they wanted to introduce novelty. So here's what they did. One afternoon, they decided to conduct an experiment. They got their script, and they cut it at every paragraph on every page of the script. They then took those separate strips. They put them all into a brown paper bag. They shook them up, and they threw them randomly into the air, and they landed down on the living room floor of their parents' house in Minnesota, where they were living at the time. They then took each of these individual strips and put them together by chance. And they then rewrote the entire script of Blood Simple. Now, once you know that, you can begin to understand why Blood Simple was such an incredible blockbuster. The reason is, is that when you read, watch it today, it's got all these crazy twists and turns, things that you would never expect to have happened before. And that's actually what the attraction of the whole movie is about. Now, when you think about it that way, you think, well, it's about putting things together, and that's really what makes for novelty. But you also find out that that in itself is also quite elusive. One of my favorite ways to illustrate this is to go to a website uh, where it's called totallyabsurd.com. I suggest you go there. These are actually patented new devices. Uh, and you could go and you could look at all these things that people have put together. Now, here's the thing. Here is an actual patented product. It's called Gerbil Boy. And uh, it's about putting together things that hadn't been put together before, really novel combinations of things. Um, and basically what you see here is, is it's um, a vest that takes the tubes of a terranium where you would normally keep your gerbils, these little rodents, and it allows you to walk around with the pets on you all day long. In some ways, it's a very interesting idea. It takes a habitat, makes it mobile, and you never have to be away from any of your pets. Now, not surprisingly, this didn't sell very well. And one of the reasons it didn't sell very well is um, in, it can be seen in its instructions. Now, you could read through this whole thing here, but the thing that turned out to be its biggest problem was is that this was so novel that people weren't really sure how to interact with it. And one of the big problems was that people began to try to clean out these tubes with garden hoses before they removed the pet gerbils to which they had to include in the actual instructions, remove pets first, please, before washing them. So one of the things about novelty is, is that as attractive as we might be to it, it's actually a very elusive thing of how you put it together in a way that makes it useful and attractive to people. The website is full of such strange combinations. Now, once I started to think about this, I stumbled upon something that really changed my mind about this whole problem. And it's going to bring up a name that lots of people have brought up here today. And it had to do with a book that I had never actually read but had thought quite a lot about. It's The Origin of Species by Darwin. I'm sure many of you know it. We've already talked about it many, many times at this conference. It's full of this blockbuster idea that changed the way we think about ecology, biology, economics, stratification, and all human systems. And you think about this book as being really full of radical new information, except if you actually take a look at it. Now, historians have done what I did before I stumbled upon it, and it was this. They basically look at the origin of species, and what they'll tell you is, is that in this book of about 550 pages, the full first 90% of it is fully conventional knowledge. It was knowledge that was well understood well-documented and accepted as truth. So the first third of the book is entirely about the breeding of dogs, something that everybody already knew a whole lot about and accepted. The next third was about the breeding of Hereford cattle, the cattle with the white faces, which was a little more esoteric, but people still understood it. The last third of the book was about the breeding of birds, which at the time was a relatively new and somewhat exotic area of breeding, but nonetheless close enough to everything else to be accepted. It's only in the last 10% does he ever get to the actual big idea. In a way, what he wound up doing was he took extreme novelty 
and he embedded it in deep conventionality. As you start to look through this and you look at what other people have said about some of this, you find out that this is not an isolated case. A very another, another famous example also comes from someone we've talked about, also someone who we believe changed our li lives and the way we think about everything, Newton. And it turned out that Newton did this when he wrote his Principia about the laws of the universe. He first invents the calculus to derive the laws of the universe, but when he publishes his laws of the universe, he first goes back through the painstaking process of reproving everything that he had derived with calculus with conventional geometry. He then publishes it with conventional geometry and the laws of physics. It's not until the fifth edition does he decide to put the calculus in it as well. This began us, made us begin to think that conventionality plays an extremely important role in how we think about science and what makes for high impact science. In fact, as you start to think about conventionality, what you begin to realize is, is that it plays a very big role in how we process any information. I'll give you an example close to home. Some of you might have been um, following some of the recent work, oops, excuse me, um, some of the recent work on how conventional thinking shapes our minds. Now, there's a website you can go to. I suggest you go here if you ever want to write a paper without writing it. REA talked yesterday a lot about how much he loves computers to do his work. Well, this is taking it to the extreme because if you go there, the computer will actually do all your work for you. In fact, what you can do, I'm not sure this is going to come up, Let's see um, if I could get to it this way. This is the actual page. And what you can do is you can put in, in you could read the information here. It'll generate a paper for you with any authors you want. Now, just for fun, I decided to do just that. And the remarkable thing about this is the following. Let me get back to my page. Is when you look at what's complete gobbledygook, your mind fights it. Your mind is going to see something that it's so trained to see in a conventional way that it's already primed to believe it. Now, I know this because before this became newsworthy, I went and printed papers from this. And I put them around my lab. I didn't tell anybody. And what you'd find is that the postdocs would pick it up and they would start reading the paper. And you could see them, they're struggling to say to themselves, why doesn't this make any sense? Why does complete gobbledygook look like it's a real scientific paper that I should spend my time reading? <laughs> and here's a way to actually see it yourself. Here's a paper that I generated. <laughs> um, and the beauty of this was, and I don't know how the algorithm knows, I didn't ask it to put in anything about complexity theory. It just spit it out on its own. And then I put in three people who I really like, Leonardo da Vinci, Rosalind Franklin, and Albert Einstein. Now, if you start to read just this paragraph, you are drawn in. Now, you can go further. You can put citations that people will have seen before, making it extremely conventional. I could start citing you know, Doyen Farmer's famous work in Econophysics. I could say it, uh, Laszlo Barabasi's Power Laws, and so on and so forth. And the more you read it, the harder it is for you to pull away. You could have it put diagrams in that look familiar to us, and all the reference sections will look familiar. There's something very powerful about conventionality. And what you're going to find in the work that I'm going to present is that it plays a very big role. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go into all 17.9 million papers in the web of science. And for each one of those papers, I am going to develop an algorithm that's going to allow me to measure how much conventional knowledge is in that paper and how much novel knowledge is in that paper. And then I'm going to look to see if what we might call the Darwin hypothesis bears out. Is it that the way you succeed is by having novelty? but only when it's embedded in deep conventionality. And here's basically what we're going to find. We're going to find that novelty does, in fact, lift 
impact, but only when it's embedded in conventionality. In fact, what this says is, is that scientific work across times, so I'm going to go all the way back to 1950, and I'm going to look at every year to today, and across every field in the web of science, all 256 of them. And what you're going to find is that the papers that are successful are the ones that move on two frontiers simultaneously. They move on the frontier of conventionality, so they bring you to the very end of what people's conventional thinking is, and then to that they add novelty, something different. You're going to find that you can't solve this problem on your own. The problem is only solved through others, something, Ricardo, that you began to touch on today. What you're going to find is teams are better at sourcing that is bringing novelty to a scientific paper, and they're better at assimilating it. And we're going to find that these effects are essentially universal across all time and fields. Now, the way to get into this is to kind of figure out how you go about coding something as conventional and novel. Now, let me see if I could share this with you without getting into all the technical details. Let me give you the intuition for what we did. We're going to say that a scientific paper is based on the prior work that it sources. That prior work represents the information that eventually is put together in a new way in the paper that becomes the new published paper. So how do you get at this prior knowledge? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go into the reference section of every paper. And we're going to pair every single reference with every other reference. So we're going to say, what's the pairing of the first reference and the second, the first and the third, the first and the fourth, so on and so forth. And we're going to say that pairings that have appeared many times together in prior work are conventional pairings. They're pairings that people have seen before, become accustomed to, have this fluency in being able to evaluate in very much the same way you saw with that gobbledygook that I just showed you. I'm then going to say that a novel pairing are pairings that have rarely occurred before together. Now, how are we going to do this in a way that allows us to measure this across time and across fields? We're going to make this measurement based on a null model. So here's how it's going to work. In the observed world, I have a paper, and I've got my references and my pairs. And I could begin to add up all the pairings. How do I know what conventional really is and what novel is? I mean, what number is going to tell me that? So here's what I'm going to do. After I do the observed pairings and I get the frequencies, I am then going to go into this vast citation network of the web of science. It's over 750 million rows. And I'm going to just randomize all those connections. After I randomize them, I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at the frequency of a randomized pairing. I'm going to do it once. Then I'm going to do it again. I'm going to get another number from a randomized pairing. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to get three numbers for the same pairing. Then I'll get four or five until I build a whole distribution of those pairings that you'd expect simply by chance. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare the observed to what I would expect it to be by chance. In the end, what that does is it brings us back to something everybody in this room is familiar with, a z-score. And what the z-score says is anything above zero is more than you'd expect by chance. Anything below zero is less than you'd expect by chance. So pairings, when you compare the observed to the random that are above zero, are conventional. And the more and more they're away from zero, the more conventional they are on a scale that is normalized. And the more that they're less than zero, the more novel they are. Once I do that, I can then build an entire distribution for every paper in the web of science. And I can characterize it as being conventional or novel. Now, to make this a little more sophisticated, here's what I'm going to do. Jan, let's say you write a paper in 2000. And you, in that paper, you reference a paper in 99, 98, and 97. When I randomize your observed pairings, I'm going to make sure that when I take the paper that you actually cited in 99, I'm going to replace it with a paper that was also from 1999. And the one from 98 will replace from one from 98. And one from 97 will replace from one from 97. So we're going to keep the structure of the network. And I'll do one thing more. If he cites a paper in 1999 that had 100 citations, it's only replaced with another paper that had 100 citations. 
And if your paper in 2000 earns 100 citations by the next year, in 2001, I've got to make sure it also has that structure. So I'm keeping the structure of the network. Now let's see what happens if you start to do this. Let me give you an example. I'm going to go to a published paper. Published paper is called The Synthesis of the Five Natural Cannabis Spirins. I chose this paper because it had the name cannabis in the title. Now, that's my first step. Next step is I'm going to go to the reference section. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at paper that was written. That's the first one. Second one that's uh, referenced. Excuse me, these are references. The third one that was referenced. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply look at these pairings. And I'm going to do these pairings for everything. When I do that, I can build a very simple ta table that's going to give me the observed pairings. So the first pair, oops, excuse me, the first pairing was between these two, second one was between these, and so on and so forth. And here are the actual numbers. This had a pairing of over 5,000 times previously through the whole web of science in the year it was published. So these pairings are pretty familiar to people. Here's another set of pairings, also over 1,000, also familiar. Familiar, familiar. These are much lower. Now, I could also go to my distribution of expected. And when I do that, here's what I find. I find that this is a whole lot more than what I've expected by chance. This is probably a really conventional pairing. This one is also very conventional, also conventional, but not as quite also conventional. This happens to be less than what you'd expect by chance. That's pretty novel. Now when I do that, I can calculate a set of z-scores that puts everything on the same scale. And of course, 0 tells me what would be less or more than you'd expect by chance. And when I do that, bingo, I get what's conventional in this paper and what's novel in this paper. Once you do this, you then go one step further, and then we get to results. And that is, so now you've got all these pairings. What do you do with them? Well, what you want to do is you want to build a distribution of pairings, because every paper has a bunch of them. That distribution will have some that are conventional and maybe some that are novel. And once you do that, you can begin to categorize your papers. So here is this converted to a cumulative distribution. Here's my z-score. Here's my lowest z-score. It's about negative 45. Uh, and then this goes all the way up to here to uh, around 600. Now, you could follow this line up. And here's 0. Anything below this is novel. Anything above this is conventional. And so how do you want to categorize a paper? We're going to boil it down to just two things. We're going to say, what is the central tendency of the paper you've just written? Is the central tendency for it to be conventional? So are the mass of the z-scores highly positive? Or is your paper tend to be novel, so that the mass of the z-scores are tending towards negative? That's one dimension. That's going to be this. This is going to be those central tendencies of the pairings. The other thing we want to look for is we want to give every paper a special chance to be novel. And where's novelty going to be in this distribution? Well, it's right there in front of us. It's in the left-hand tail, because that is where your most negative numbers will be. Here's a way to think about it. Let's say I wanted to look at the height of a basketball team. I could look at its central tendency for height, and it could tell me whether the players on average tend to be tall. But if they do that, it doesn't tell me if there are some really you know, short players on the team. For that, I'd have to look at the end of the distribution. And that's what I want to do. I'm going to start comparing papers. And I'm going to get to that Darwin hypothesis by looking at a paper's central tendency for conventionality and whether it has any novelty in it. That I'm going to do for everything in the whole entire web of science. This is just a set of um, characteristics of what we did with the random model. I don't think it's necessary for me to go into the detail. I've given you the basic intuition of how it works. Now, what does this begin to tell us about us? Well, let me show you one last paper to describe this as an example, and then the big distributions. So I'm going to show you two different papers. One's going to be a hit paper, and one's going to be uh, an also-ran. I'm going to choose them from the same journals. 
Here are the two titles. They were both published in the same year. They both have the same number of references, but this one has a whopping 3,900 citations, and this one only has 12. What does its anatomy look like in terms of conventionality and novelty? Here's a way to see it. Here is the hit paper. Here are your novel combinations. All my z-scores are negative. And here are my conventional combinations. All of these are positive. So here's high novelty, because it's got some really low uh, negative z-scores. And it's got high conventionality, because it's got some really high positive z-scores. So its central tendency is to be highly conventional, but it also has high novelty. If you look at this paper, what you find is it's only got one novel uh, site, one novel pairing in the entire paper, and it's just barely novel. It's just barely below zero. It's negative 0.78. It also has a bunch of conventional pairings, but not nearly as conventional as that conventionality. So this paper, unfortunately, and what you'll find is it illustrates one of the patterns. Papers that aren't really conventional and that aren't really novel tend to do very poorly in our world. So let's take a look at what we can find out from some of this and what it all means. Let's start with some distributions. Let's look at the distribution of median conventionality for all the papers in the web of science for the decade of the 1990s and 2000s. So here's my zero again on my z-score. Anything above it is conventional. Anything below it is novel. Now, one of the things when you look at this is, is that what you find out is that scientists as a group are highly conventional in their work. If you look at this and you go to half the papers, half the papers have a central tendency of conventionality that has a z-score of 2 to the fifth. We really thrive on conventionality. As much as we say we prize novelty, so much of our work is actually highly conventional. A very small amount has novelty. If you look at the novelty side, and here I'm just going to look at that bottom 10% of each paper, that left-hand tail. So this is really focusing in on just those papers there. What you see again is about 40% of the papers have a uh, z-score, where the z-score is below 10%, basically has a uh, novelty that never goes above like 2 to the third. So even when our most novel stuff is never really that novel, entirely for a paper. We're very conventional as much as we love novelty. Now, if you take this, you can begin to get to what the results actually look like. So here's my conventionality. Here's my novelty. So I'm going to do a simple non-parametric cut of the data to understand what's going on. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do the following. I'm going to say, here's my tail novelty, and I'm going to split it at the median. So here's papers that have high tail novelty. Excuse me. I'm going to split it at zero. They have uh, high tail novelty. They're below zero on the z-score for their bottom 10%. And here are papers that have low tail novelty. They're above zero for their bottom 10%. So this would be a basketball team that's got some really short players on it. This is a basketball team that doesn't have any short players. I'm going to do median conventionality. Is it, it's low if it's below the population's median as a relative marker, and it's high if it's above the population median. Now, when you put this together, what do you get? Up here in the corner is where you really get conventionality. You're kind of at the frontier of conventionality. It's highly conventional, but you're also mixing in high tail novelty. This is like Darwin doing 90% on well-known conventional knowledge, and that last 10% is something truly novel. Over here is people who are doing highly conventional work, well-established, well-understood, but not much novelty at all in it. Up here is really something that you might consider avant-garde. It's got low median conventionality, but it's got very high novelty. I had done some work in the creative arts, and what I would put in there is like off, off way, Broadway. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but this is kind of like where the actors don't actually face the audience. They got their back to the audience. They don't speak in language. They speak in like dolphin clicks. You can't possibly know what's going on. Well, that's basically what's happening there. And then here, it's neither of, of 
either. It's not very conventional, and it's not very novel. Now, when you look at this, what do you get from it? I'm going to take that 2 by 2, and I'm going to lay it on this uh, surface. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the probability of the relationship of having this combination with actually being a hit. I'm going to define a hit as a paper that's in the top 5% of the population of papers, OK? So these are papers that are top 5% of um, citations. Now, if none of these things had any relationship to citations, each of them should have papers of no more than 5% hits in them, because I'd be blindly dipping into the distribution. What's my chance of pulling out a hit? Well, it's 5%. If it makes a difference, what I care about is anything that gets me above that 5% background rate. Now, when I do that, here's what you get. What you find is that the combination of high tail novelty and high conventionality nearly doubles your chance of having a hit over the background rate. It has a probability of being selected of just about 10%. Now, if you multiply that over the, all the papers that you write within your career, you begin to see just how powerful this combination of information could be in helping you create that hit paper. Now, if we go to here, this is our high tail novelty box. This is the box that when you read through the literature, they'll tell you this is what you're looking for. We're looking for something really novel. Well, it turns out that stuff that's really novel, that lacks conventionality, doesn't get you anything more than really just the background rate. You do no better than just chance there in terms of background. If you're highly conventional, Again, it's only just about 5%. What happens here is this practically doubles your success over the next two categories. Where you definitely do not want to be is here. This is you know, the avant-garde box. There, if you go to Darwin's Tower, you're six times as likely to have a hit than if you're in this box. Now, after we did this, what we became concerned about is how universal might these findings be? There's a lot of things that we did that we'd like to figure out if we were to change them a little bit. Like if we were to put some stress on this system, would it still hold together? So you might say, well, I don't really like 5% as a hit paper. What I really like is only those 1% you know, because those are the ones that really matter. Or maybe you're a little bit like, well, hey, I don't care about the 1%. I'm happy to get into the top 10%. So what happens for the top 10%? Or maybe you don't like the idea that you know, that left tail is the bottom 10%. Maybe you think the bottom 20% should matter, or the bottom 1%. And you might also ask, this is putting together all the different fields in the web of science. So what this is, is this is mixing you know, physics with chemistry, with sociology, with geography, and a whole lot of other things. So maybe it's just a big grab bag of stuff. Well, let me show you what happens when we break this down. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same exact analysis that I just showed you for all the papers. But this time, what I want to do is break it down over time. And I'm going to break it down over what you consider to be a hit paper as the 1%, 5%, or 10%. Now in the background, what I'm running is a whole bunch of regressions with a whole ton of controls of things that people have already talked about are likely to affect whether it's a hit paper or not. Like, how many citations does it have? Um, you know, is it a top journal or not? And all this other stuff. So what I'm going to just show you is the outcomes. Now, let's start here. This is what I just showed you, 5%. And if you were to look at Darwin's Tower for 1950, 1960, 1970, 1980, 1990, what you see? is it dominates the whole time. So if you go back in time to the web of science, Darwin's Tower has actually been the thing that does, in fact, have the highest chances of being a hit. If you look at the other um, towers, what you find is, again, very similar stuff for the really novel stuff, excuse me, for the really novel papers, they're hovering right around the background rate of 5%. For the really conventional, also hovering around at the background rate. You can notice that there's a slight upgrade here through time of papers that are increasingly novel getting more and more hits. That reflects, in part, the fact that science is drifting 
each year to more and more conventionality, as I've already talked about. Now, let's do a little more stress testing. Let's go up here to the top 1%. So now what I'm looking at is the really super papers. And what you find, it follows the same pattern. Darwin's Tower dominates. If I go down here to 10%, what you find is Darwin's Tower, again, is the place where hits emanate from. Now, once we did this, we decided to also look at what about if you begin to care about that left-hand tail? Maybe 10% is not a good cutoff. In some ways, it's arbitrary. So what we did is we changed it around. I showed you here, and the green tower dominates. If I go here and I make it just at 5%, still the top tower. If it's just 1%, it's still the top tower. What you find is that a little bit of the right kind of novelty mixed with conventionality turns out to be the thing that separates hit papers from most everything else. If I go here to 20%, it still works. When I get to 30%, it stops working. So the model is fairly robust to different types of sensitivity. Now, the last thing we said is, OK, we've looked at this over time. We've looked at it with different measures of hits. What about if we break out each field separately now? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in. I'm just going to look at physics. Does it hold for physics? I'm going to go in for chemistry. Does it hold for chemistry? I'm going to go in for women's studies. Does it hold for women's studies? So on and so forth. And when I do that, here is the major findings. Field by field patterns. This is ranked as where the most hits are, second most, third most, fourth most. And here is the green tower that we've been focusing on. What this is saying is that for just about 65 fields in the web of science, these patterns that I have shown you replicate. If you care about the first two towers, about 85% for the fields in the web of science. Now let's back up for a minute. What this is telling me is this feels like it's nearly a universal pattern because it's so broad across science. But you might not be happy with 65%. But this 65% actually makes up about 95% of all papers written. And the reason for that is, is that you have whopping fields like physics, which has like a million people on the planet contributing to it. And then you've got some very small fields like um, geography, which has perhaps 1,000 people on the planet contributing to it. And what you find? is that this works for the really big fields. So if I were to convert this just to the number of papers written, this would hold true for over 90% of all the work written year by year in the different fields. So as we do this, what you begin to see is a universal pattern starting to emerge. Now, once we did this, we began to ask ourselves, well, how do you get there? What do you do to be able to find this sweet spot in terms of going through prior knowledge and being able to put it together in a new way that winds up having creativity, something new, a new innovation. Well, that's really the next step that I'd like to share with you. And what you're going to find is that the solution can't be done on your own. It's really only done with other people. Now, this is going to bring me back to some work that we did a few years earlier that had to do with uh, increasing dominance of teams in the production of science. And um, I just want to mention it briefly, uh, because it really leads to the last result that I want to share with you on this particular piece of work. What we did is, at the time, we also went into the web of science. We also looked at about 20 million papers. And we also looked at about 1.9 million patents published worldwide. This is a small piece of data set that Doyen Pharma mentioned uh, a couple of days ago. And what we wanted to know was, how is team work influencing scientific production of knowledge. And here's the first graph that uh, we produced on this. And what we did is we broke um, web of science into fields that make up science and engineering, like mathematics, physics, so on and so forth, social sciences, economics, sociology, arts and humanities, and then here are the patterns. On this dimension, we look at time. We're going to go back to 1950 to 2000. And we're looking at the percentage of work that's done in teams in science. Now, each one of these little scatter points represents a different field. There's uh, over 200 uh, fields here, different fields. And what this says is that if you went back to 1950, 
in science and engineering, already 50% of all published work was being done in teams rather than by individuals. If you scoot all the way up to the modern period, today in science and engineering, almost 90% of everything published is done in teams. Now, that in itself may not sound surprising. We know that bench sciences have grown. But the thing that was really surprising here is that even in uh, fields like mathematics, the same pattern holds more and more being done in teams. If you look at the social sciences, their rate of growth is about the same as science and engineering, although it started low and still remains lower. Humanities is also growing, although you can't see it because of the, the scaling here. And what you also see is that patent work has also increased in exactly the same way. Also, not only is more things becoming team-oriented, in terms of the production of science, but teams are getting bigger through time. So scientific teams were about two. Uh, the duo was you know, the most prominent back in 1950 in the hard sciences. Today, it's trios, and so on and so forth. Now, here was the thing. When we did this, we also thought that the growth of teamwork was happening inside the same institution. That is, we thought the teams were growing you know. At Harvard, if you went back to the 1950s, you had small labs. Now you had really big labs. And all of this was just because labs within the same place were growing in size. And there was a lot of research that said that it should be that way. You have this like you know 30-foot rule where you can't work with people unless you can see the whites of their eyes and stuff like that. But well, we decided to investigate that as well. But before we did, we went one step further. And that was we looked at the relative impact of teams to individuals. And we created a metric that allowed us to compare the two. And if teams and individuals were likely to have the same citation impact, uh, this line comparing the two would lie right here on uh, the reference line of one. And one of the things that you find is that teams in the modern era of science have always done better than individuals. As much as we live with the idea, even back in the 1950s, that it was the great mind that was making big discoveries, it turned out, empirically, that wasn't true. It was always teams that were doing better. And teams are increasingly doing better with time. So this says a lot about understanding teams and their effect on what's happening in our own scientific work. So the last thing we wanted to do was we wanted to look at what's happening with the growth of teams. Now, this chart is a little hard to interpret, but basically what it's saying is two things. One, almost the entire growth in teamwork from 1950 to today across all the web of science is not happening inside a single institutions or within single universities. It's all about cross border, across institution, across university pairings. That is, the amount of teamwork that was done inside the same universities back in 1950 is the same level as it is today. All the growth is occurring across boundaries, which gets at this search for new kinds of knowledge and ways to put knowledge together that you don't have exposure to within the limited size of the groups in your own university or institute. And this also shows that of the teamwork, the ones that is across university boundaries have a better chance of being a hit than the ones that are done within the same university. It turns out that if a Harvard professor writes a paper with a Stanford professor, that paper has a higher um, probability of being a hit than if it were two Harvard professors or two Stanford professors. So, so much of what we're doing is revolving around teams. Now, there's lots of reasons that people have given for this. Some people say it's a search of knowledge, as I've already mentioned. Some people, it's about change in norms in science. For some people, it's about heavier lifting and breaking a problem down. In fact, you could have lots of different ideas, but no one's ever been able to put it together and connect it to a large-scale empirical finding. And that's what we wanted to do here. And here is what we decided to do. We decided to look for the role of teams in this connection between conventionality and novelty. And here's what we found. 
Here's tail novelty. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take tail novelty for the 1990s, and I'm going to give you its distribution. And I'm going to break it down by solo, pair, and team. Now, if you guide your eye along here, what you see is that the amount of novelty for a solo in a paper is consistently below the novelty that a pair would have, and it's consistently below the novelty that a team would have. What this is saying is that teams really bring much more novelty into their work. And you see that consistently across the entire distribution. If I were to show you this through time, you'd find out that this is also a consistent finding. You'd also find out something quite interesting, and that is the following. When you look at novelty that's brought together here, novelty is really two conventional ideas that have never been paired together before. How do I know that? Because what we did is we looked at what was making up novel combinations. And so these are combinations that have never been put together before. If you follow one half of that pair back to the other things that it's been cited with, what you find out that has been a highly conventional pairing with lots of other things, but in different fields. Really what happens is novelty is nothing but a conventional pairing of two conventional ideas that have never been put together before. Conventionality is driving a lot of what we do as well. Now, if that's the case, let me ask you this. If I were to show you this plot, but to show you for the conventionality of papers, do you think teams are more conventional or less conventional than individuals? What would your intuition say? You think they're less conventional. Yeah, I might agree with that, but what you find out is this. What you find is that teams and individuals and pairs have no statistical difference in the level of conventionality that they bring to papers. Individuals on their own seem to be just as good in putting together conventional combinations as teams. That means teams are able to get you novelty, but not at the expense of conventionality. So there's not a trade-off that's going on. Once we did this, we come to our last piece that I think puts it all together. How do you put together novelty, conventionality, teamwork, and the probability of having that hit paper rather than an also ran? And that's going to be this. Let me start by just showing you comparisons for solo authors. So here's what I'm going to do. Follow me with this. I'm going to take conventionality of all the papers, and I'm going to break it into its different deciles all the way up to the top. So this is low conventionality is a central tendency of a paper in terms of the prior work that it references. And here is really high conventionality. And on this dimension, I'm going to look at probability of a hit. Remember, 0.05 is what the background rate would be. OK? So really what you want is you want something that's going to get you up in this region above the 0.05. Now I go one step further to introduce novelty. I have my papers that are conventional here on this dimension. And then I split them into a line that says just the low left tail novelty and just the high right tail novelty. And when you do that, what you begin to see is the following. You begin to see that high tail novelty does better than low tail novelty at any level of conventionality. So novelty is really important. Because at any level of conventionality, no matter what my slice is here, novelty always does better than conventionality. However, if you really want to get to that sweet spot, what you have to see here is you also have to bring yourself right to that frontier of conventionality. Because that's really where you start to optimize that combination. If you go way, way all the way out here to this distribution, of, convention, of conventionality, 
what you find is you start to reverse the effect. And there's no difference between high, and high tail and low tail novelty because there's very few papers out here. Because once you go all the way to the end of conventionality, you're losing your opportunity for uh, uh, novelty. All that conventionality starts crowding out the possibility for your novelty. Now, this is the general pattern. What you find is that it reproduces itself for duos and teams. So let's take a look. Here's duos. And here's teams. What you find is the same pattern. High tail, convention, high tail novelty always does better than low tail novelty at any level of conventionality. You also find that it has this same kind of shape, where what you're looking to do is go to the frontier of conventionality and mix that with novelty. And that's what gets you to this essential sweet spot. The same thing is going on when you get to team authors. But notice that what teams do, what, what duos do over individuals is what teams do over duos. They raise everything. So what happens here is you're getting better assimilation of novelty and conventionality. What do I mean by that? Let's do the following. Let's say I take it right here at 55, and I've got a mixture of novelty and conventionality for individuals. When you do that, you only do about this well. A duo that has the same mixture of conventionality and novelty does better. If you're a team, the same mixture of novelty and conventionality, you do better. Teams are not only better at reaching for novelty, but if you were to give them the same level of novelty and conventionality that you would an individual and have them put it together into something, teams seem to produce higher impact papers with the same raw materials. So if you begin to look at this, what do you find? You start to find that high tail novelty is always better than low tail novelty. What you're really looking to do is mix the two together. If you go too far with conventionality, it actually reverses on you. And given the same material, teams write my highly cited papers than duos or solos, because they do better with the same raw material. Whatever that mix is, they'll do more with it. Now, after we did all of this, we began to think about how wonderful it is that as science, we've got all this raw material. Because as time goes by, we've got more and more potential conventions. Now, what I'd like to do is to show you that that might not necessarily be the case. Before I do, let me leave you with a couple of thoughts here. One of these has to do with Henry Ford. And basically, what he says is, I invented nothing new. I simply assembled into a car the discoveries of the other men behind whom were centuries of work. Had I worked 50 or 10 or even five years before, I would have failed. So it has to do with all new things. He's also talking about these combinations of things and how, as time goes by, his ability to have put together combinations is really what separated him from other people that went before. Einstein had his own little take on this, but in a different way. Knowledge has become so vastly more profound in every department of science. But the assimilative power of the human intellect at, remains strictly limited. Hence, it was inevitable that at the uh, activity of the individual investigator should be confined to a smaller and smaller section of science. If you were to think about all of this, what we got from it was the following. We look at all of this knowledge. We talk about being able to assimilate it in new ways and put things together. But actually, there's another side to this. And it has to do with the burden of all of this knowledge. How do you actually use it? And that's the last thing that I want to leave you with as we're trying to understand this problem. And it's going to look a bit like this. I'm going to go into the web of science. And I'm going to look to see how many papers are published every year. Now, 
I'm going to go to 1955, and what you're going to find out is, is that in the web of science, in all recorded history prior to the year 1955, there were all of 41,000 papers ever cataloged. Remember, this was before the world of uh, many institutions worldwide, of colleges and universities, of uh, journals, and so on and so forth. Just 41 papers. Now, let's say I was to go to the year 1965, and I ask myself, how many papers were published in just the year 1965? Anybody have a guess? What do you think? In just one year? 250,000. You said that if I got you to look up, no? I guess I, I, guess I did OK. Uh, but I'm glad you answered the question, although it's wrong. OK. Um, it turns out that it doubles. OK, so in one year, twice as many papers are published than in the prior history of the world. Before that, if I go to 1975, single year, it doubles again. If I go to 1965, in a single year, it doubles again. And these numbers are just for science and engineering. I'm leaving out everything else. If I go to 1955, 1995, you get about a half a million papers. 2005, 814,000 papers. And if you go to 2012, 1.2 million papers. That roughly breaks down to a paper every 20 minutes, which is faster than you could possibly read it. Now, here's the thing. What is all this knowledge doing for us? And here's where I'm going to go back to some of the things that Doyen talked about some of the things that were talked about earlier today. And it works like this. We all have a certain amount of bandwidth, so to speak, to understand the knowledge around us. You have something like 2,000 hours a year to stay on the frontier of just your own area of science. So what happens is, is I'm looking at the frontier of science from just this amount. And that amount is kind of fixed. But every year, the frontier grows. So what happens is, is that I see a smaller and smaller fraction of that giant frontier. How does that influence the way we do our work? And how do we begin to understand how that's influencing our ability to get to these combinations? That's the last thought I want to leave you with in the five minutes that I have. And I'm going to show you a couple of cartoons, but it's basically to give you the intuition of what's happening in science around us. And it looks something like this. Imagine the following cartoon. I write a paper in the year 2000. And all of these red dots represent the papers that I cite in different years. So this says that I write a paper in 2000. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at really recent work. And I cite one thing that's about 11 years old. That would be one way in which I could dip in and look at the previous knowledge. I could also do this. I could you know, have the same number of references. I have kind of the same amount of reach into the depths of prior knowledge that have been published. But I'm much more distributed in how I'm uh, sampling over that terrain. Instead of me being all bunched up, kind of taking everything from the years, you could think about this as progression of knowledge through time. I could do something like this. I could have like a really far reach way, way back in time into science. And I could be very clustered back there. So I'm writing something in 2000, but I'm basically citing a whole bunch of work from the 70s. Or I could have like a really nice reach. And across that reach, I'm pretty well distributed with my breadth. Now these dimensions turn out to be quite telling in what's going on in science. So. Think about this as kind of like a low reach, low breath. This one is kind of like low reach, but it's got more breath you know, relative to its reach. Down here, we've got like high reach, but the breath is low because it's all back here. And here, you've got some high reach, but low breath. Now, if you, I'm sorry? Yeah, I'm sorry, what does it say? Yes, high reach, high breath, thank you. Now, the question is, what are we doing in terms of dipping into that pool of prior knowledge? I mean, one of the things that I think has been really interesting here is that much of the work has been talked about in terms of some of the classics from centuries ago and some of the most recent work that's kind of been forgotten from the 70s, but interesting insights. 
What we did is we went to see how people are actually using this body of knowledge. And again, we created an expected and observed reach. So let me just show you what's happening here in science. Here is the reach of papers. So the papers go back two years, four years, six years, eight years in terms of that reach. Like what's the medium level that they're going back? This is long reach. This is short reach down here. The expected with a simple random model would be growing in this way. And what you find is that this is what science has done. It pretty much kept up to about 1975. And then after 1975, we have pretty much remained flat. From 1985 all the way to 1995, our reach never expanded. That myopia that each one of us has as an individual is basically being seen on a population level. We are stuck in looking at just a small swat of science. And it kicks up just slightly around here near the end of the internet. You could also measure it this way, and this is just kind of normalizing it. But again, what you see here is your observed is never keeping up with your expected. So although we have more knowledge and we have more things that are available to us, we're actually using less and less of it. If you look at breath, what you find is that breath is doing pretty much the same thing. We never keep up with the world around us. As that frontier grows, it's growing faster than we can keep up, and we're always getting a smaller and smaller fraction of the potential raw material that we want. Again, the same thing here. Now let me show you just a couple of findings that follow from all of this. I'm going to skip this for now. And I'm going to look at something that's just going to divide the world up to give you a sense of science. Here we have papers that are very recent and have very low breadth. Here are papers that kind of like look through time. They've got very high reach. And they distribute their, their sampling of that through time. Here we have papers that have very high reach, but they're only looking way back in time. And then here, we have papers that, again, are relatively recent, but have high breadth. Now what I'm going to tell you is, is remarkably, this also has a very, um, a very pronounced signal with impact. I'm curious, as you look at those four cells, which one do you think is correlated with the highest impact? I'm sorry, Jan? High reach, high breath? Anybody else? What do you think? High reach, low breath. Hmm. Well, here's what people actually do. And what you find is that you got pretty much the same distribution of papers in all of them. It's not as if people favor one versus the other. All four are about being used about equally the same. But if you look at what has to do with impact, what you find is that impact is highly clustered in this cell. Here's a way to see it. Again, I'm going to look at top 5%. Here's low breath, high reach. So I'm going way back in time, but I'm very narrow. Probability of a hit in this category is way, way below the background rate. And I'm doing nothing to the data. This is all raw data. I'm doing nothing to massage it. If I look at low breath, so um, it, low reach, so I'm doing stuff that's really close to me in time, and I'm not really covering that space very well, I don't do really well either. If I go to high breath, high reach, Jan, you get closer. But you're never really getting over that 5%, and you're kind of dipping down. Now, here is what you get for high excuse me, low reach, high breath. Papers that get something contemporary. This, this, this is uh, every year I'm looking at these distributions separately. Okay. So, it, so this says in 1970, the probability of a hit for papers in this category was just about 1%. Yeah, exactly. What you can see is that this green truly dominates. Now, I could keep going and I could start to take apart the anatomy of much of this. But the thing that we find that's behind this is the following. Papers here that have um, 
low reach, going relatively close back in time, but high breath, do something special that other papers don't do. Those are papers that tend to do citing of the most contemporary work in their own area, and then grab hit papers from other fields. And it's the combination of well-earned knowledge in other fields mixed with something in your field that gives you the signal. Now, one of the ways in which we were able to verify some of this is if you go to the University of Pennsylvania's museum, there is an archive of over 4,000 self-reports of scientists talking about what made their hit paper a hit paper. It's pretty remarkable. It goes all the way back to the early 1970s to today. And one theme that comes out when you look at this, this qualitative self-report is that the people who hit, hit, uh, write hit papers will tell you that what I do is I search very locally within my own field about the most important questions and about the most recent breakthroughs that people have been doing and that people have accepted. And then I look outside my field for similar things that people have done in other fields, and I import that into my paper. This essentially is this idea of taking and making novel combinations, but understanding it this way, because this is where you're grabbing that hit paper from another field and bringing it into yours. Here? No, if it's a low reach uh, paper, it's a two years or it's a five years? So uh, it's about six years, OK, for the medium. I'll leave you with one last thing to think about, and then I'll close. And it's this. What is this doing to the macro environment in science? So imagine the following. We're all looking at our myopic view of this increasing frontier of science. It's always growing. We see a smaller and smaller fraction. And what we do is we occasionally take something from another area. Because that's all we can do. We're just barely keeping up with this, and occasionally we grab something from outside that area. That's that breath up here. But here's what's happening. As this process is increasing, we, that is all scientists, are increasingly grabbing the same papers from other fields. That means that the hit papers, as years go by, have a greater and greater share of all citations. So if I'm going to do something on complex systems, and the hit paper in physics has to be, happens to be something by Duncan Watts, I'm more likely to grab that paper today than I was five years ago, than I was five years before that, when the paper was originally written. Our sampling of this breath, although it's important, is increasingly choosing the same set of papers, which in many ways is crowding out ideas. What I started off talking about, this vast knowledge and how valuable it is and how it allows us to put all these combinations together, I think one of the biggest problems we all face is that truly it's turning out to be a burden of knowledge. And that may be one of the greatest challenges we all face in producing good science going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, questions? I really like your talk, and it's really hard to do it by talking about the crowding out of ideas. Uh huh. But um, but I do have one one concern, yes. which is is the question of of whether what you're calling novelty is really novelty or is it something else, and and so because I would worry that it might just be unusualness or maybe even obscurity. And to see what I mean, imagine that I'm a, you know, imagine somebody who's working on a particular kind of beetle. And there's 10 other people that are interested in that beetle. And they write their papers every year about those beetles. And so there's a particular combination of papers that they, of, of citations they make that's relatively un, not well represented within botany or certainly within biology as a whole. So I'm worried that those guys would pop up as being novel, even if they were writing the same basic paper over and over again. And I'm worried that, that, that my, my, my worry about that was, was reinforced when you said that 
small fields, what you're doing doesn't work as well in small fields. Mm -hmm. You said that, you know, 65%, but 95% but of the papers, that's saying the small fields, this kind of selectively doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just wanted to express yeah. that so, concern. So, you know, I, and I think it's a great concern. We worried a lot about it. And I think in, in this particular uh, piece of research that we're doing, we can't get into some of the finer grained definitions and texturing of what novelty is. In fact, it's a very multidimensional concept. And what we've pretty much uh, drawn on is ba basically combinatorics, which is talking about novelty as these things that hadn't been put together before. Now, I could go one step further, and I can tell you that since we've written this paper, people have looked at it as really a basic methodology for novelty. So three weeks ago, I was at Yahoo, and I was there talking to their research scientists. And each group was talking about how they were going to use this model to help them think about their next generation of innovations, which is something that I think you care a lot about. So I was talking to the user engagement group. And what they had was a list of things that they coded as conventional and well understood uh, features of a website that have user engagement related to them. And then there were novel features. And what they wanted to do was to build a system where they could see what's the probability of all of these pairings, just like we did here with references. And they're going to use that to figure out if that will create the kind of novelty that will improve user engagement. That may, in fact, be the best test of what we want to do. Because there, in a simple or smaller system, where you could get into the minutiae of all the aspects of novelty, we'll know if we have that or not. No, I, I, I like the methodology. If I could just ask a follow-on question. Yeah, sure. I, I wonder, I, I would be curious about sleeper papers. Like, take Ed Lorenz's famous 1963 paper on chaos. Sat there more or less unsighted for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And then people discovered it in the late 70s and suddenly started citing it, and it just took off. Yeah. And so I would say papers like that are the most, the most novel papers because they were genuinely ahead of their time. Mm. Have you, have you looked at those? So, you know, uh, in this vast self-report uh, history of papers, uh, people actually talk about their sleeper papers. And what comes from that, and, you know, I haven't done this systematically, so I've read it and I kind of see the, the pattern uh, qualitatively, is they will say that that paper was a hit only because another hit paper cited it and raised its profile. Otherwise, you know, my idea ahead of its time never even would have been known as the idea ahead of its time. And what attracted people to the paper was actually the citation from another paper. And they'll talk about getting um, citations that they don't even think people read their original sleeper paper. It's just being cited along with the other paper that was the hit. So sleeper papers are tough to get at. I love the idea. I wish I could find a way to, to do it in this. But thank you. It, Thank you. Um, what I wanted to ask is an effect which one might call cognitive herding. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think what, uh, what we see in your really convincing analysis, so I, I congratulate you Thank very you. much to this work. Uh, but I think it applies mainly, if one may make that distinction, to within paradigm novelty, not to trans paradigm novelty. I wonder whether the really the, the very few really groundbreaking um, novel ways of thinking can be captured with this statistical methodology. And uh, uh, just as a anecdotal evidence, uh, when um, selecting, um, for example, in Germany, directors for Max Planck Institutes, we we always have the problem that those um, who, who today perform best in terms of their uh, Hirsch factor, whatever we, one, one takes, are not the most original brains. Because the most original brains have long, often many years to fight until they get a paper published. Mm -hmm. So I think we are really on a, on a wrong track if we take too much of these statistics. I think it's perfect for within paradigm, but trans paradigm innovation may require even methods that go beyond that question mark. Yeah, so, you know, um, I, I, I don't want to say that this explains everything. everything. 
Uh, and I think trans you know, paradigm innovations are very unique. They tend to be very rare in and of themselves. So your interpretation of what actually made that work is just an interpretation, which has its own problems. Um, and in some ways, this is, in fact, inspired deeply by what was, a tr you know, as you put it, a trans paradigm innovation. It was really about looking at how Darwin did it and how Newton did it. And I think on a smaller, more measurable scale, not only in terms of you know, the importance of the idea itself, but in how we do it today, that same underlying structure remains. This idea of embedding novelty in really conventional thinking. So I think there is a connection, although it doesn't explain what you want. Yes? Um, it was a lovely talk. Thank really. you. I really enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> Good. Uh, I have a few questions. The, the one is the following. I'm a somewhat old-fashioned guy. You're a? I'm a somewhat old-fashioned guy, uh -huh. which means that I not only write books occasionally, I even read them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and that makes me think, because if I think about concrete examples, it's true that people take um, you know, when made, they make the recombinations from other disciplines, but depending on the disciplines in which they, are, they work, that can actually be, the critical input can be from a book and not from any, so what are you, what are you doing with books? Because in some disciplines it still has a very important role. Mm -hmm. That's the first question. Second question is the following, how do you factor out this crowding around multi-author papers? by the following way. Imagine those papers by, written by physicists which have got 3,000 authors, right? Now, of course, you can say, I'm excluding self-citations, but that still doesn't help, because e suppose each of them has got five PhD students, right? Which are definitely going to side. So you will get an incredible hit rate, right? So I think it should be normalized somehow with the number of authors, just to see the real impact. So that's the second. What do you do with the number of authors? Um, and um, OK, that's it. So two, two questions. Uh, OK, so uh, the first question about books can have a very short answer, which is we didn't look at books, uh, because there's no way to do it in the web of science. Um, and you're right, in some fields, books are much more heavily weighed than in others. Um, second piece is, you know, how do we normalize for teams? Well, it, it sounds to me like you're saying that if I have five PhD students, they're going to read my work, and they're going to have their PhD students read their, my work, and so on and so forth. So like, teams kind of have this multiplier effect in, in marketing of your ideas. So two things that we do on that. One is we do, in fact, bin the data only to look at you know, solo, pairs, and teams. OK? So we're looking at that. So we're, we're holding that constant, and we still find the effect, even though we're holding teams constant. So one way to do it is statistically. The other thing we did is we went through this entirely painstaking analysis of removing, as you put it, all the self-citations of all the papers. It like took like nine months to run. Uh, and here's what you find out about self-citations. Turns out people do self-cite their work, but they really only self-cite it for about two years. Then if no one else cites their work, they stop citing their own work. Uh, and if they stop citing their own work, self-citations don't have an effect. And if they keep citing their work because other people are citing it, their effect winds up being diluted by everybody else's. So getting at you know, whether there's a marketing effect that's part of this, um, you know, I think that some of that may be going on. But once we start to bin the data, we can still see our effects for novelty and conventionality while holding teams constant. Thank you. So um, with time, I, we have um, three, just three more questions. So let's start with Peter, then to you. Peter, then to you, then finally to me. OK, so Peter. OK, so, so I'm here. Hey. <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. It's, it's quite inspiring, um, but it's also a bit worrying. I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure if I really 
So I might have to do stuff at some point in time because one thing that I really do not really understand. So you build a whole skyscraper of arguments uh, about this, um, uh, this confessionality and originality, etc. But it's all built on, on, on just looking at one thing, basically, the references. And what if that's wrong? What if, what if just the whole concept of, of, of quantifying things, segmenting things in terms of, of novelty and non-novelty, uh, in terms of references, is just wrong. So my question would be, maybe you mentioned it, that's why I said maybe I do yeah. stuff. But my question, did you do some kind of sensitivity analysis? Because what you do is you do this randomization process, and mm -hmm. then you look how things deviate from the randomization, which is a normal thing to do this kind. But then also normal is to look at the sensitivity analysis. What, what if I'm a little bit wrong? What if, for instance, self-organization plays, not self-citation, but self-organization plays a role in references, which is happening, we know, because some journals only publish things if you cite papers from that same journal. And, you know, and people are very much aware of that, and people organize themselves with respect to that. And there are all kinds of tricks, and definitely since the Hirsch Index cut off, people invented new tricks um, in, in the way they, they, they give references to it. I, I'm actually an editor-in-chief of two journals, so I know uh -huh. how these things go. Yeah. And so, I'm, so I would be a bit worried, or maybe, maybe my worry is wrong, but so like I said, maybe I do stuff, but, but I would say that I would look for a sensitivity analysis of, of assume that this whole skyscraper that you're building, that there is something wrong there in the bottom. You know, how sensitive is that whole mm -hmm. skyscraper construction with respect to that? Could you argue, say something about that? Yeah, too? so two things. One, in terms of are we really measuring inf uh, knowledge in the paper based on the references? That work had already been done by a scholar named Henry Small, who, in a very fine grained way, matched up references to content of papers. And so instead of us replicating everything he did, we simply built on that. I would encourage you, you know, in the interest of time, that if you're interested in that, go look up Henry Small. He's, it's like you know, a great unsung hero of this whole area of research. The, you know, the other piece, which is, you know, is there something going on in the background here? The only thing I could say on that is, is that if we're looking at this over time and across different fields, and you believe that over time these mechanisms that you might be imagining in your mind that could be driving all of this in a way that's inconsistent or with my explanation or makes my explanation spurious, you'd have to believe that that is consistent across time despite how much science has been changing, despite how much it's been growing, despite how the topics we do have changed. And it's also consistent across fields, even though fields have very different norms about how they do science. So my guess is, is that across that variation, we've found a signal that comes out even though those things might be going on. And from our point of view, that's what we're trying to get at. We're trying to get at some universality. Yeah, um, I have uh, two two questions. Um, I enjoyed your your talk very much. I find it interesting that you look uh, novelty by the correlations of previous citations. Yes. And how that impacts uh, the citation of the paper you're looking at. Um, and then you look at at, at this uh, breadth and, and and reach. So, f first first comment or question. You you have an ex exploding number of papers and a fairly stable capacity of humans to read papers, right? So say a human has the capacity to read 2,000 papers or... They have a person bite. They have a person bite. Yeah, okay. And so, and so that means that over time necessarily, if you're going to integrate knowledge, it will have to be with larger teams, which, which you do observe, that the only way you can maintain a certain breadth and so on is, is by having different people read different papers and have them collaborate. But obviously then they have to have some capacity to collaborate and there might be some inefficiencies in the process. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering about the issue of, of uh, breadth versus uh, inefficiencies of team size that, that, that uh, you know, we might all be struggling with. That, mm -hmm. uh, um, and, and whether there's anything of that. Uh, yeah, so um, the, the, yeah. we actually looked at this in an earlier paper. Basically what you find is that, think about it as a lift. Mm -hmm. The lift that a duo has over an individual is slightly greater 
than the lift that a trio has over a duo. And that is slightly greater than a quartet has over, over the trio. So you, you know, maybe in your mind you're getting diminishing returns to the number of people on the paper. I mentioned it because there's this puzzle in, in economics that says, I mean, I presented in my talk a model that has this combinatorial stuff. And the combinatorial stuff means that the more stuff you have, things should be growing exponentially. But the world growth has not been accelerating, at least in the leading countries. Mm -hmm. And that's in spite of the fact that we have this exploding number of possible combinations. People have posited that the idea is that maybe because we have an explosive number of, of combinations, it's becoming harder and harder to look at what are the relevant possible combinations from the, the, the exploding number of combinations. And I was wondering if something of, of, of that trade-off leading to sort of like a... Yeah. And then, that, that was my first comment. The second comment is, you know, Aristotle wrote a lot about biology. Uh, biologists today think that what he wrote about biology is crap. So nobody cites that. But they think that what he wrote about philosophy is still interesting. <laughs> and, and I just mentioned this as, as the idea that in some sciences, in some sense, all the past knowledge is expressed in the more recent papers. Because they have built upon the last one. They've thrown away the irrelevant and have kept the relevant. So, if you just read the last five years or the last 10 years, all the previous knowledge, relevant knowledge, is embedded in them, OK? While in other areas, you know, you have to look much further back. But you can't because you have a person back, right? You have your 2,000 papers. And, and you know, if you've read the last, the last 10 years, you've, you're done with that. So you can't go any further uh -huh. back. So there might be some endogeneity in, in, in how far, far do you need to go uh, you still need to go to Aristotle if you do philosophy, but not if you do biology. Um, it, and that might be a, 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 spe, a, a field characteristic. Vis-a-vis -vis the problem that you know, the farther back you go, presumably, the larger the number of papers you must have read. But since you have a limit, you can't go that far. Mm -hmm. uh, OK, so the first thing on combinatorics. Right? So um, I think the combinatorics question is answered a bit by what Yahoo's trying to do. And it's also answered a bit by what a game manufacturer who contacted me is trying to do. They already have lists of categories of how you could describe different products. So if you're making a video game, you know, is it um, first person shooter? Is it um, a chase game? Does it have cars in it? Does it have mummies? Does it have ice mummies? Does it, you know, um, it, it, does it have a maze in it? You know, all of this sort of stuff. And all they want to do is say, what have been the pairings that I've seen before? And what would be novel pairings? And then I want to find the right mix of that. So when I hear back from them, people read the work and they say, oh, I need a 90-10 mix, don't I? And maybe that's the solution to your problem in a very simplistic way. The, in terms of going back to Aristotle, remember that I think what this is saying is that you actually don't want to go that far back. You don't want to have a very long reach. But for whatever your reach is, you want to have good breadth over it. So you may, in fact, be citing recent stuff, which is supposed to be the accumulation of all the best knowledge up until that time. But you want to make sure that you have the right coverage of that. Otherwise, what happens is, is that your paper is missing significant things of current knowledge that it needs. And that's what's, what's coming out here. Now, the breadth is your ability to grab those things. And what current knowledge turns out to be is stuff that's outside your field, not just what's in it. So as your field's accumulated a lot of knowledge about important things, it turns out outside your field, that interdisciplinary hop has a piece of knowledge that's important. And that is, I think, when we get into the anatomy of that green line, is what we find. Uh, oh. OK, a useful challenge for you. Could you write a program that <laughs> generates what I would call the inverse of an edge index? Uh -huh. a, Classifying papers that must have been quoted 
but they are not quoted because the tendency is not to quote the original idea when you find it again. And there must be an algorithm that allow you to identify those papers by showing that they knew about the other paper and they do not quote it intentionally. Oh. Uh, basically, classifying papers that should have been quoted in your page index, but they are intentionally not quoted. Mm. Gee, that's it tough. Must be easier than what you did here. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, what would be the ground truth? Like, how would you know that someone was supposed to have cited your paper but didn't? That can help you. you could see that I mean, getting a, past our own ego. Oh, well, you uh, see that somebody was instructed not to quote it, but uh, there are simpler things to do. If the paper started a field, and you could show that some, you if the paper started a field, and you see that somebody who quoted it before start not to quote it, you have a mathematical uh, way uh -huh. to classify it. Mm. It's not difficult. Yeah. Maybe you I'd have to think about that. I don't know if I've got a, a good answer to it. Um, but one way in which we're trying to, to maybe get at this, and I'll just end on this note, is we're trying to work with a publisher that's giving us papers when they're submitted. And then we want to see what references get added or pruned as it goes through the publication process. <laughs> and what we're trying to figure out is the papers that get, is there something to the pruning process that takes you from here to green? And that may get out what you're looking at. OK, thank you. <laughs>